I think it's great. I think it's definitely like a good idea if you're like looking to get involved in the C++ industry to come, talk to the people, to meet everybody. Uh, you never know what can happen. Welcome, folks. Uh, I'm Matt Kulukundas uh, at Google. This is a talk on building a lock-free, multi-producer, multi-consumer queue for TC Malloc. And this is kind of interesting for me as a talk because this is the first time I'm talking about something that's almost entirely my own work. My previous talks have been very much about a large team of people working together to do something, and this is mostly me. Um, you will note in the lower left corner there's a little chip that says TC malloc on it. Those chips occur throughout the talk. They are, generally speaking, links to the git commits of the appropriate thing if you want to go check them out. Unfortunately, to fit code on slides, you often have to gently massage the truth. Uh, and so like, they're there for you to really see. Um, this talk is also interesting because it actually starts at CppCon. In 2019, I was doing talk, watching talks, and Chris Kennelly gave a talk on TC Malloc. And I thought, that looks really cool. And he works at Google with me, so I could totally do some stuff in there, because like TC Malloc, which is the thing that implements malloc free or new and delete at Google, is just a really low level thing. It's a lot of fun to hack in. And so that was where I sort of started, was at a CppCon talk, seeing a thing that I thought was going to be a lot of fun to play with. TC Malloc at a very high level, is best thought of as a series of caches. The user calls malloc or free, and we try and satisfy that request at the lowest level, at a per CPU cache. And like this is where a lot of the magic happens. It uses a lot of assembly and restartable sequences to be super duper fast. And I looked at that and I thought, oh my god, that's way too advanced for me. So then I pulled up and I said, well, what about the other side, central free list? This is the part that interacts with the operating system, and it gets giant. Thank you, and it divvies up these page size chunks, and you know has very complicated internal data structures where it uses the memory it's managing to hold the scratch bits for its own data structure, and it's very clever and has a bunch of advanced algorithms in it. And I thought that is way too complicated for me, and then I looked at that middle layer, the transfer cache. And the transfer cache is, as currently implemented, it's actually just a stack with a mutex, right? And things push and pop on it, and it grabs the mutex, and its big job is that it stores data in a format that the CPU cache likes, as opposed to the very complex format the central free list likes. And it just helps to mediate transfers between the CPU caches so that they don't have to go through the more expensive central free list form format. So in any given request, you can fail through all these layers of caching, but you're usually satisfied by one of the layers to the left. And internal to Google, we have a lot of fleet-wide telemetry. And the mutex that is the transfer cache's mutex is probably the single most contended mutex in all of Google. And I thought, well, that's a great place to apply some concurrent programming. And you know, concurrent programming, from my perspective, is just a fun place to hurt yourself and do things you shouldn't do. And like, where else do you have the justification to do the things you shouldn't do? I'm going to actually take a brief aside, though. I'm going to talk about where I learned a lot of the things that I think about when designing concurrent data structures. So this is Rich Hickey's talk from the JVM Language Summit in 2009. Are we there yet? And Rich, Rich Hickey uh, from Clojure's fame proposes this very high-level lexicon sort of for how you should think about concurrent programming as a very large concept, not we're well past CAS as a concept here, right? And so one thing to realize is if you structure things correctly, you have an identity that evolves over time. And any particular person viewing that identity will see a snapshot of it that may be old the moment you start seeing it. Right, you're seeing a state in time where the identity has continued to evolve. And then you have these things that bring you from one state to another. In some senses, those Fs are your CAS operations on your atomic. But you could do it you know, at a higher level. This is also how you could build a um, 
a sort of multi-version concurrent con system where you see, when you do a view, you see a single version in it, but other things adopt it later. And one of Rich Hickey's key observations in this in a well-designed system is that observation should never block mutation. You always want to be able to say, just give me something close to head, I'll see what it is, I'll look at it and I'll understand it in my local context. And as long as I always know it's probably potentially old, you can get a very nice behavior out of it. On the other hand, Jeremy Manson gave a talk in 2007 at Google New York called the Java Memory Model. And this was all about at the lowest operations. How do you talk about things? You say, this happens before this, this happens before that, and therefore I have an ordering between these threads. And if you can't speak with the formalism of happens before, happens after, acquire release, if you're unable to bring that level of formalism to your concurrent algorithms, you probably have bugs. And so it's just useful, the strictures of the language are really helpful in how you think about it. The language, your language and your behavior with it influences the way you approach problems and the burden of proof you demand on your concurrent code. In 2011, Martin Thompson, among others, introduced uh, disruptors with LMAX. But I learned most about it from Trisha Gee's blog. And Trisha Gee has this great series of explainers on the disruptor pattern. And so when I first came to this problem with TC Malloc, I said, well, I know a concurrent thing that I could probably use here, and I'll base it off the disruptor. And so what you're going to see is very heavily inspired by the disruptor pattern. And you might try and bog down very specifically on like what idea is the disruptor pattern, and don't. Like I really encourage you to read about disruptors and to read about this, and you'll see how they're interplayed, but I'm not gonna draw the line perfectly for you here. I'm just sort of telling you where my inspirations came. So let's go back to what does the transfer cache look like? And let's consider it when it's a single writer queue where we use a mutex. For simplicity, we're only gonna look at one end of our queue, right? What happens here when we want to do something? Well, we write our new data into the appropriate pot, a spot while holding our mutex, and then we advance it and we release our mutex. And that's it. It's a mutex, it's actually quite easy. But how does this work if we want to support multiple producers at the same time? So instead of a single head pointer that we keep a mutex to guard accesses to, we're gonna split this into two things. A pending pointer that allows us to say, this is where our in-flight work is going, and a committed pointer that says, this is the finished work that other sides of things can see. So when a new thread wants to push an element, it bumps the pending pointer. And in fact, another thread may come along. And now both of them have bumped the pending pointer, and the committed pointer hasn't caught up. But importantly, they can both be in parallel pushing data into this slot. And then one of the threads finishes, and it says, well, now I want to advance the commit pointer. And here we actually have a serialization point in the queue that we're building. We say that you have to advance the commit pointer in order. So the first thread that finished has to spin for a little while waiting while the second thread finishes. And then that thread finishes, advances its committed element. And then the first one that was waiting to advance one more step advances its committed element. So let's see what this looks like on the other side. It's actually really directly analogous, right? Each thread advances the pending line on the tail, except now as they proceed through it, they're consuming elements out of the queue. And once they've both consumed it, they can advance the commit lines incrementally until they're done. So, so far, I've kind of just shown you the bits in isolation. This is the very high level of how this concurrent queue works. But I haven't shown you how it fits together. This is what the standard queue looks like in its sort of daily operations, right? You can actually see that there are two threads that are inserting to the head and two threads that are removing from the tail. And you can tell this by the distance between the commit pointers and the pending pointers. And this ability to sniff at how many threads are actively working at your queue is actually a useful ability later. We'll get there. So what does it look like when it's, this is sort of normal, it's kind of empty. What does it look like when it's full? Here when it's full, 
you have this interesting distinction. The queue is full of both data that's there and the pending data. Your fullness depends on your pending data because you can't push a new pending thing while someone may be draining the tail. So this is a logically full queue and eventually those commit lines will advance and given this queue, when all everything quiesces, it will have two spaces available as the head committed line advances to head pending and the tail committed line advances to tail pending. But right now, there's no more space for concurrent work on this queue. This is what it looks like when it's empty. Here you can see that there are no active threads. At a very high level, this is the set of invariants that I'm trying to sort of highlight in it. And it's important to realize that everything has to be viewed circularly at all times. I'll give you a moment to read while I enjoy this fine Diet Mountain Dew. And remember, all of these sort of less than or equals, you have to implicitly view the queue circularly. It's a circular queue. So thus far, I've explained in a bunch of atomics and how it fits together, but I've kind of elided a few details, like how does this fit into the rest of the world? Uh, if you don't mind holding questions at the end, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna try and go back and fill in the steps between the machete and the coconut. I did in fact hide a fair amount of complexity. So this is what I look, this is sort of what the end interface looked like. But if you dig through the history, it actually took me many iterations to land on this formulation of the set of helpers that I was going to use. Um, you'll forgive me for presenting everything as if I had realized this superior architecture from the start. The commit messages are accurate. If you do draw through the history, you will note I've picked things out of order in the commit history to make a more sort of legible story. So let's talk about claim insert. This is the very first thing. That's what bumps the pending thing. How does it do it? I'm actually gonna give you a moment to read the code, but I will also walk through the code bit by bit. So it starts out by grabbing the head pointer, right? This is saying, where, and in these slides, head is head pending. I just had to squish things to make things fit because line lengths. Um, so you grab the head pointer and you look at the current tail to say, and this is the uh, tail committed line, to say, am I out of space, right? Can, do I have enough space to push new elements in or am I just out of luck and I should bail out of here? Assuming I have the space, it's great. I'm gonna say I'm gonna advance the headline by as much as I need to, and then I'm gonna cast it in here. Now one thing I forgot to mention at the beginning of this slide is that there's a bug in this code. And it's a really subtle bug. And if you see it, please build a time machine and go back to like early October of 2020 and warn me, because it would save me a lot of time. But there is a bug, don't just go using this code verbatim. So once we've got this compare exchange weak, and once we've moved it in, we've claimed the range we want, and we just tell people that was the range, otherwise we retry, right? We start up again and pull things through. Uh, out of curiosity, does anyone think the bug is that I failed to refresh old head after the failed compare exchange week? Y'all are better at this game than I am. I always forget that compare exchange week takes a mutable reference to its first argument and it will update that mutable reference for you. Uh, this is especially pernicious because Google doesn't usually use mutable references and so you stop looking for mutation and plain parameters. But that is not the book. And don't worry, I will get to the book eventually. What's the other interesting thing? How do we advance the commit line? It's actually less interesting than the claim range. In a loop, we try to advance from our old commit, or where we thought just before us to just after us. And you'll note, I have to keep overwriting temp position so that it doesn't overwrite the value with the current thing or it will always succeed on the second try and that will be bad. 
the observant among you will say, wait a minute, this is a spin lock. And you're right, it is a spin lock. The big thing that I've done though is allowed multiple threads to concurrently be filling in or extracting batches. So I've narrowed my critical section down to just this lovely pause instruction. For those that don't know, whenever you have a spin loop, it's kind of good form to throw a pause in there just to let other threads get a shot at it. It's kind of one of those like, we all agree this is the right way to do it. And yeah, maybe, maybe not, but it's sort of the habit. Thus far, this talk has been a bit like a treasure map in a video game. I said like, when you find yourself in this place, look here and there will be treasure. And I haven't told you where this place is or how to get there or how to find it. Now you're wandering around the world looking at your map being like, is this a spot I could use this? How do I get this here? So I'm gonna now go into the practicalities of this. How did I break things up? How did I test it? How did I optimize it? When I started with TC Malik, the various parts of this were very closely tied to each other. And so you couldn't easily change the transfer caches APIs without changing the CPU cache in the central free list in a way that was really kind of annoying. So instead I encapsulated a little bit. I put a transfer cache manager in there so that I could isolate it from the different components, right? At its core, TC malloc has all its components in globals because it's malloc, it's global. And it ties them all together closely with no virtual dispatch because it's malloc. It can't afford a virtual dispatch. So in isolating this, I also went a little bit further and the internal thing that was the transfer cache, I now templated on the objects around it that makes up, make up its ecosystem. In prod, these templates come out to be the globals that we talked about. But now with this, I can finally write unit tests. I'm like, okay, maybe all of you don't see that like actually refactoring TC malloc so that you can unit test a component in isolation is a big achievement, but it is. And it's really useful. And like once I had this kind of ugly basic environment set up, I then went about sort of code golfing my unit tests for lack of a better term, because I wanted it to be even cleaner and simpler to interact with. So I built this thing that is a little environment that has some fundamental operations on the transfer cache. And it's templated so that I can get all the things I want. And wait, what what is that, that's foreshadow. I promise it becomes interesting later. But now my tests are really easy to write and really clean. And so I can test a lot of things about the exact behavior, right? This is great for white box testing of my system. So now I have this functional thing that I can test with a standard API. I can write a ton of tests with much less boilerplate. And this is sort of the feeling I get at this point in things. Um, for those who don't know, this is Miho Nanaka. She won silver at the climbing Olympics, uh, climbing combine Olympics. Don't get me started, it should have been three events. Um, and I, like really I just, I empathize with this facial expression of like, here I am, I'm in a relatively stable position, there I want to be, how do I get from here to there? I hope you all have this expression at time, from times because that's when programming is at its most fun. Here's a small hint. Also, Deep Space Nine is the best Star Trek. No one will ever convince me otherwise. Here's a slightly larger hint and a callback to our earlier foreshadow. Let's look at that randomly poke. I am in balance sort of doing operations on my queue that will statistically net out to an unchanged queue. Sometimes I shrink it, sometimes I grow it, sometimes I insert, sometimes I remove. And it all just kind of, it's about equal times for these. Where did I pick these numbers? Out of a hat. The only important point is that they roughly balance each other. So now I can write a test that just spins up a bunch of threads and randomly pokes at them. And the really nice thing about this 
is because I bothered to isolate this out of TC malloc and into a separate component, I can run this with debug allocators. I can run this with ASAN or MSAN. So this is great. I told you all of these randomly poke were, were evenly balanced, but we know queues have corner cases. Can we push our concurrent queue to hit those corner cases? And the answer is, it's pretty easy. We have one dedicated thread that's different than all the others. And so that thread can just insert. And now I have one thread that's always inserting while the rest do a sort of balanced milieu of operations. So I'm probably gonna hit the corner cases where my cache is full. Or I can just remove. And I'll hit the corner cases where my cache is empty. Or I can shrink it and I'll hit it where my cache is tiny. Or I can grow it and hit it where my cache is large. And because I have sanitizers, ASAN, MSAN, UBSAN, TSAN, I can get a wealth of correctness checking that I couldn't easily get if I had tried to manually get all the thread interleaves I want. So now I have all these tests, I have all this infrastructure, let's see how it works. I don't really know what I expected. I mean, I do know what I expected. This is what I expected. But I really, like, I tried really hard not to end up here. And I spent a lot of time staring at my atomics and thinking very deep and hard thoughts about them and like poking at things until a coworker of mine, Andy Sofer, had a small suggestion. Just put a giant lock on every method in your fancy lock-free queue and see, does it still happen? Yes. And that's great because now I can stop looking at my atomics and start looking at my arithmetic. Because I don't know if anyone here is able to write a simple circular queue with correct arithmetic on their first try, but I'm not. Guaranteed. I have the evidence. You can see the commit messages. So once I knew that, the fix, it's actually pretty easy, but it doesn't fit in a slide. Just take my word for it, it's not actually an interesting fix. I had a bug in the wrapping, mea culpa. So now that we handled that bug, the test pass, everything's good, right? All right? Anyone remember this code? There's a bug here. Here's a hint. Here's another hint. Here they are together in case that helps. How do we know there's a problem is the first question. I asserted that there was a bug and you all take my word for it because who's gonna say to a programmer, no, you're wrong, there's not a bug in your own code. Well, the answer is run our fuzz tests many, many times. At Google, I just do this. Back when I worked in startups, I would rig up a thing and spin it for days or hours, but now, I got 5,000 machines, easy, cheap. Uh, pro tip for anyone at Google, if you set this number to greater than 5,000, you get put in a slow queue for people who are consuming too many resources. <laughs> <laughs> so, just set it at 5,000, it's fine. Um, and, you know, don't forget TSAN. If you're gonna run 5,000 times, you might as well run in the most rigorous threading mode you can. And here it comes out, it fails in about one in a thousand cases. Well, there's a bug, but remember that trick Andy said of like put a giant lock on it? Well, that didn't fix it here, but TSAN has something like putting a giant lock on it. Here, you can just say, I don't care if I told you it was relaxed. I don't care if I told you it was acquire or release. Always make it sequentially consistent. And if you're lucky, your bug will go away, your bug will go away and you'll know to look at your memory orderings. If you're unlucky, you still have a bug. Well, I guess I'm now at the worst part of debugging. I'm gonna have to read the error. It's a data race. I really can't say that I'm remotely surprised that my one in 5,000 thing or one in 1,000 bug was a data race. I'm like, let's look at the lines associated with the data race. Oh my God, it's where I access the data. This is entirely unsurprising. But like I took so much effort to make sure that it was right. Like I used the words of acquire and release. Like 
see, advanced commit line here is supposed to release, and claim remove is supposed to acquire. If you don't say, I put it in the comments, it must be true, right? Well, I guess I'm gonna have to go stare at the code some more. No, I totally got it right. See, here's the release, and, here, whoop, and here's the acquire. And this only fails about one in a thousand times. So if I got this really wrong, it would fail much, much worse. So let's pull back from the code for a second and think about the algorithm and what's going on. This is the hardest part. I've exhausted all of the tricks in my book except thinking, and I hate thinking. So what happens if I acquire this view of head committed and then go to sleep for a while? Ages come and pass, leaving memories that become legend. Legend fades to myth, and even myth is long forgotten when the age that gave it birth comes again. Here, I woke up. The world looks the same as it did when I went to sleep. But none of the data is the same. Welcome to the canonical ABA bug. While I'm sleeping here, empires can rise and fall around me. And as long as this contains the value it contained before I went to sleep, I am none the wiser. I started at A. I had a glass of water. It was a clear liquid. I turned around. Someone replaced it with vodka. I turned back. It has a glass of clear liquid. It must be my water. The ABA bug is the illusion of object permanence in programming. The usual fix to ABA bugs like this is to keep an epic counter. Epic or epoch, I don't care. Fight in the comments. Uh, you keep this epoch and sort of rev it whenever you rotate around the end of the buffer or something like that. But like, that's four bytes. It's four bytes and an atomic. I'm not sure I can afford that. I'm in the guts of TC Malik. Fortunately, there's a cheat. Remember when I took this modulus to keep myself in the range of my circular buffer? I'm discarding a whole bunch of bits. What if instead, I just leave them unharmed? Now, instead of overflowing once to return to my original state, I have to overflow two to the 32 times to get back to my original state. That seems like a lot. I'm gonna call it good enough. The only small thing I have to update is now when I access those, I need to chop them to the appropriate range. But really, not so bad. So now that we've pounded out the bugs, it's time to see how fast our creation is. First thing we're going to need are benchmarks. Fortunately, I took the time to encapsulate everything so that I can even set up fake environments for these benchmarks. And now I can glue it, to, glue it together directly to build a benchmark. Um, fair warning, to actually do a multi-threaded benchmark and Google test requires a fair amount more gunk. I encourage you to look at the commit. There's more to this, but I had to chop it to get it down to 14-ish you know, lines of code. But I now have a benchmark and I can just tune per threading parameters and I can see how does it do. Don't try and read them all. I'll walk you through the interesting ones. First off, in low contention. In a low contention environment where we only have like two or four threads kind of gently poking, um, we see roughly comparable performance. It's interesting that we see a higher variance, but not entirely surprising either. And I'm early enough in the project that I don't care about the variance. I'm just gonna ignore it for now until I get something else. But here at high contention, where I have a lot of threads slamming this, I am seeing wildly better performance. I'm seeing it go 2x faster. This is awesome. I can just smell the tasty promo I'm gonna get when I like save all the resources. So I'm gonna plug this thing into web search and see how it goes. This is very, very not good. QPS is queries per second. It is a measurement of throughput. When I do better, that number goes up. 
17% is a very large loss for web search performance. So now here's the problem. I've got my benchmark, but benchmarks are quite artificial. I thought I was doing this game. I'm actually doing this game. So don't get me wrong, both of these things have value, but I wanted to land something that was a win in this game, not in the first one. So let's go back and look at our environments, this little thing I faked up. Do you remember these parts of it? Perhaps these fakes aren't actually modeling the overall system particularly well. My minimal fake central free list behaves like the central free list, exactly like this picture of a pipe behaves like a pipe. And it is important not to forget that fact, that when you've created a tiny environment in any artificial sense, it's not the real environment. That 17% number I told you, that's not the real 17%. That's actually if you just take a single leaf for web search and load it. If I put it out in a huge cluster, I don't know, it might be 24% slower. So it's important to keep these in mind. So let's look at what this fake does. I said it was minimal, didn't I? I mean, the real central free list is such a large complicated data structure that I avoided manipulating it because I wanted to do something fun. So clearly, that's not going on here. So let's think about what's actually going on in our highly contended case. In the highly contended case on our old system, there was a mutex that would just stop everyone and everyone would build up and then they would access it. And in this, in the new case, I just let the pending lines move very far apart and I occupy it all with maximal parallelism and I very quickly get to the point where my pending lines touch. And I can now very quickly say, hotel's full, find another place. And so, the old system, with its mutex, was very efficient at saying, wait for someone else to finish their work so you can see if your work got there. And the new system is very, very fast at saying, house is full, go talk to the really expensive dude. And that really expensive operation in the central free list might be where we're getting this. So at this point, we have a theory. So how do we make our micro benchmark how do we validate this theory? And one option is I could make the micro benchmark more like the real thing. But I didn't do that because that was hard. It's actually quite annoying. The real thing has a lot of complicated behaviors. But I could try and figure out like what stats could I keep that, that tell me the real world factors I actually care about. And that's relatively easy to do. If I just put a little bit of stat counters into my environment, I can now ask it, are you seeing decreased hit ratios at higher concurrency or not? And lo and behold, it holds up. The old system was always getting a sort of 90-ish percent hit ratio. And the new system, the more concurrent you are, the faster it's saying, nope, you're a miss, go to the central free list. So we now have data that supports our theory. Honestly, this exact behavior for other systems could be desirable. And here's the real rub in concurrent programming, is it is impossible to separate out the constraints of your system from your data structure. The reason multi-producer, multi-consumer queues are, are a field of active research is because there is no one-size-fits-all answer. Look at your system and understand how your system wants to interact with these concurrent operations. Mine doesn't want to do this fast path, go straight to the expensive operation. Fortunately, there's kind of an easy answer here. I can just sniff my tail to see if there's operations in flight of the other flavor. Here's the spot where we were sniffing our tail to decide if it was full. But what if instead I do this? I see that we don't have enough size. I sniff at the pending line to say, okay, like maybe, maybe I need to wait here. And after the pending line has resolved, I just 
after the pending line has resolved as a motion, I just do the whole thing again. I recurse. Um, I don't actually recurse. I use a go to because I needed this not to blow the stack in debug builds. But you know, I, I, I recurse. Um, let's look at that await change that I had there briefly. It's actually really simple, right? I'm just saying like, huh, has this value changed? And once it's changed, I'm done. The observant among you will say, wait, you now have two spin locks in this talk that I was promised a lock-free queue. Well, I hit the ground running and it turns out I needed something, but like, Sure, I've got some spin locks, and I have two of them. I have this little one here on await change, and I have this other one here on advanced commit line. And they are both spinning, and they're doing, like, they're burning CPU when, like, other threads could do real work. Well, I try to think of a way to improve this. You folks talk amongst yourselves. I'll give you a topic. Futex is neither fast, nor user space, nor a mutex. Discuss. Futex is actually a low-level utility that you can build a mutex that is fast and entirely user space in the non-contended case from this utility. It's a bit like calling a supply of nails, lumber, roofing, and cement a Chura house because you can use all of these parts to build a cheap, durable house. Also, we should never let programmers name things, ever. It's really better to think of Futex as a number of distinct operations that relate to each other as good building blocks. And in the syscall, you do this with this lovely Futex op that you pass to the syscall to sort of tell it which thing it's doing. But it's better to think of it notionally like this. It has a value, and you can say, as an atomic operation, if you are this value, atomically put me to sleep. That's wait. Wake just says, wake up some people who are sleeping. I'll tell you how many. If you use a number other than one or you went 32 max, you probably have bugs. It is really hard to reason about because it doesn't guarantee who wakes up. Wait bit set is an extension on wait. It has the same compare and sleep operation. But it also says, just like keep this bit set as some metadata. I promise I'll use it later. Wake bit set is its friend. It will wake up people. And it takes its bit set and compares it against the waiter's bit set. And if they have a bit in common, that waiter will be woken. So it's a way for you to say, I wish to wake up everybody who has this property. There are a bunch more operations on Futex and I'm not gonna go into them because I didn't use them. And they're really confusing. So the nice thing about Futex, unlike the class I just showed you, is that you tell it what memory address it should look at four bytes of. And yeah, it says it's UN3200T, but it's the kernel. It's just a pointer and four bytes. You can give it a pointer to a stood atomic. You can give it a pointer to the low four bits of a pointer if you want. You can really do anything here. So let's see how I can use this knowledge in my new setup. Await change is easy. It just says, well, I'm going to futex wait. And as long as the value is the current value that I thought it was, well, you're not the right value, so I'm going to sleep. That was easy. But you shouldn't always go straight to a syscall. They're a little bit expensive. So generally speaking, people wrap them in this, like you do a little bit of an eager spin before you do it. And like here, we're firmly in the realm of like, look at your benchmarks, look at things, and then consult the tribal knowledge of like cabal of evil people that manages concurrency. And then cargo cult, whatever they tell you to do. This is a slightly improved version, which is basically what we do internally now. How do we update advanced commit line? This is gonna get a slightly larger overhaul. I'm actually gonna break it into a few helpers to make my life cleaner. I'll give you a moment to read. So it looks like await equal is doing most of the work for us here. 
And a weight equal is like a weight changed, except the other direction. A weight change says, I think I know your value. Wait until it's not this. And this says, I don't know your value, but wait until it is this. But other than that, it's basically the same. So let's go back to the Futex API and see if we can do anything clever. It's odd that whoever wrote these slides put these two methods in here, but then didn't use them. I bet we can do something clever with these methods. In await change, we know that there's a specific value, or we know that any value at all here is suitable for us to wake up. And so we just say, I'm gonna have all the bits. Wake me for anybody. And in await equal, we're saying, there's only one value I care about. And I'm just gonna assume for a second that I can have a function that will sort of go from my desired to a useful bit set. Do I know what it is yet? No. But that's why functions are great. And how does advanced commit line work? Now, when we wake things up, we need to wake up people with the appropriate bit set. So we're just gonna use the same function. Hopefully it works. So what are the properties we want this bit set function to have? Each time we're advancing, we want it to have no unique bits with any of the other recent times we're advancing. So clearly, we're trying to collapse this uint32 into a bit pattern with minimal overlap. This sort of a bit pattern. Each step, we want it to be different. And actually, that's a really easy function to compute. And so, yes, we will get collisions eventually. But collisions are okay as long as you have retests as appropriate in all your logic. And the important thing is our collisions are maximally spaced from each other in the domain of our queue. It takes 32 competing concurrent operations on one side of the queue before they start to see collisions. So as long as my like, number of waiters is lower than 32, I'm only gonna wake up the correct one. So I've got this whole system set up. Let's see how it goes. In truth, there were bugs, and it took me a few times to track down some of them, but like, actually, they're really not that bad, and amusingly, most of them were in my offsets and not my concurrent code. I, I swear, all of my bugs are in offset handling. So with this in hand, Let's go back to our micro benchmarks and see how they perform. It looks really solid, right? This is before and after my optimizations. And now, where I used to tail off, I manage these internal crosses basically all the time. We never miss an opportunity to cross propagate. And it actually gets even higher hit rates than our old system because of this. This is super awesome. Let's give this puppy for a spin and see how it does. That was not what I meant. Here we are. Let's give this puppy a spin, see how it does. And it is not detectably different on web search. At least it's not 17% slower. So I'm gonna scout around for other systems that I can try this on. Yes. I did actually put it on a car. It was still within the margin of error. Uh, if, if you looked at these numbers and the web search numbers combined and you squinted and you really wanted to believe, you would see that it was slightly negative. But it was not statistically significant. And I scouted more and I found someone that had a thing somewhere between a micro benchmark and a full thing but after like five attempts, this is the only thing that had actually given me a statistically significant and strong result. And it said, you're three and a half percent slower. So, <clears throat> but like before everyone takes the bear's side on this, I think the duck or pigeon or whatever has a good point, right? We refactored code and that's just fun. We added fuzz tests and those are gonna be useful for a long time coming. We got to debug an ABA issue 
And if you don't think that's fun, you should stop doing concurrent programming. <laughs> we learned how our benchmarks don't actually resemble our production. We got to track down a few kind of nasty bugs. And I got to learn how, how Futex works. Like all of this stuff was great fun. A lot of interesting things for me. Plus, I've got a great idea now for a clever concurrent data structure. What if I use the existing thing, but instead on a failure to acquire the lock, I use flat combiners and elimination buckets? Hopefully this will work out. And hopefully I'll be talking about it next year. But that's where I am this year. Questions? So the, the question is, if I eventually get to a syscall on any of these things, isn't it going to be a large slowdown, a much larger slowdown than any of my micro-optimizations? And you have to remember where we started. We started with a mutex. And mutex is actually implemented by a futex. And so I've moved when I sleep, and now I do better selectively waking up things. I only wake up one person who has the proper next step. And I can do better sniffing, and I can get parallelism during the copy into phase of things. And so, yes, it is, it is entirely possible that like, the overhead of the extra atomic operations overwhelms the winds. And you have to be careful, and you have to measure on these things. Uh, so the question, yeah. So the question is, what other existing solutions did I look at? Um, and the answer is, this was sort of the first one. I started with disruptors, which are a concurrent thing like this, and that was where I started. And I implemented one. And after I've gotten the sort of null result that I've gotten, now I've started looking at um, the flat combine work and the uh, elimination buckets came from Todd Lipcon, saw that I was doing this, and was like, hey, here's some fun concurrent papers. And I read those, and I was like, oh, yes, now I can hurt myself harder. Um, uh, and so the process isn't done. And yeah, I, there's a talk coming up in like 20 minutes on another concurrent data structure, and I'm totally going to that talk, because it sounds fun. Uh, we have online questions. Okay, so um, there are a bunch of questions from the same person, so I just want to pick one of his. Um, his question is, with Futex, is this a Mutex implementation in some respects? Yes. So the question, I don't think I have to repeat the question for the online audience because you're mic'd. Um, yes, Futex is a Mutex implementation in some respects. And the biggest thing that I've done here is move my critical sections out so that I have very small critical sections at the periphery and get full parallelism while doing the main workhorse of things. Uh, I see a question there, and then I'm going to go back to online. Yep. So the question was, Futex is only faster than spin lock if the wait time exceeds some certain value. And where do you draw that threshold? And the answer is nobody knows. Remember when I had that like, oh, I spin for 1024 loops before I go to the Futex? That's attempting to recapture some of that and saying like, ah, oh, my spin lock, I was in the recently acquired mode fast enough. Um, but like the truth is that no one knows and it is particular to your system. Uh, online? The question is, have you examined or tried existing lock-free solutions, for example, Moody Camel's concurrent queue? <laughs> So uh, the, the question was, uh, as, as asked here, uh, have I tried other existing solutions? And the answer is not yet. I started with one of the existing patterns that I knew of and adopted an existing pattern. And then I went through the process of learning and exploring. And next up, I'm going to try some other existing. And for the specific answer of Moody's, no, 
I didn't try it, I've never heard of it before now, and I'm gonna have to read about it. Uh, Yes. Uh, yes, it was, the QPS number is evocative and true in this case, and I elided the other numbers, but I do have it. And yeah, Daisy? Did you look at various exponential backoff patterns or various ratios of this call to um, exponential backoff? No. Uh, so the question was, did I look at different backoff patterns than my naive spin 1024 and then Futex? And no, I, I didn't get to that point because, you know, my first set of experiments with it told me I needed to really go in this direction of having sleeping and waking up and sniffing on the other side. And at that point, I was at about a half percent. And I didn't think I was going to get multiple percentages of wins by just tuning at that level. Yeah, I mean, so the observation is like, I could have done exponential back off instead of constant pause, but I do know when I need to wake, and so that is like not necessarily the thing. Um, I saw a hand there that then went down. So I'm gonna paraphrase the question a little, which is, did I show the results of both the Futex thing on web search and the results of the pre-Futex thing on web search? Um, and I did. The web search result with before I had the Futex when I was not sniffing at my tail was about 17% slower. And the implicit slower than what is the original Mutex implementation. And then when I switched to using a Futex, it became only half a percent slower, give or take. And that's once again implicitly compared to what? Uh, I've got Margo, then you, and then online. Um, so micro benchmarks are great because of the really short OODA loop. Like you can have an experiment and you can iterate back and forth very easily. To do the whole prod web searchy thing is at least a day. And like, I don't like to spend a day between fiddling things. And so it's important and it's valuable, but you also need to not follow it too blindly. And so they each have different parts in different values in different parts of the process. And that was why when my micro benchmarks returned different result than my system things, I tried to change what I was measuring so that I could measure something the full system cared about. Uh, the mutex under contention is reported, I see you there, um, the mutex under contention is report, oh, repeat the question, it's a different sign. Uh, the question was, uh, what evidence other than that there was a contended mutex, was it that this was a fruitful thing to pursue? Um, and the answer is sort of twofold. One is that the, the fact of it being a contended mutex doesn't come from microbenchmarks, it comes from production data. And so we know it is in fact contended in production. And then the other part of it is we have seen other changes to this system, this part of this system, yield large results. And so we know that there is gold in them of our mountains, and now we're just trying to find it. Uh, we had some online questions. 
What is the rewrite ratio in the real environment? What is the rewrite ratio? I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Uh, what is the read-write ratio in real environments? Uh, there are no reads to this queue in some sense. Everything is either a push or a pop, which is a mutating operation for the queue. And if the question is, what's the ratio of pushes to pops? It actually really depends. If you have a producer-consumer system where you have one CPU that's spinning on producing elements and another CPU that's spinning consuming them, you'll see this one will do a whole bunch of allocations, which will drain its transfer cache or will drain its CPU cache. And this one will do a whole bunch of deletions, which will fill its CPU cache. And then the full cache goes to the transfer cache and says, I'm full, please take some. And then the, the producer's CPU cache says, I'm empty, please give me some. And so you'll have the data pivoting back between the threads via the transfer cache. And in a production system, they sort of definitionally net out even, except that there's a slight bias towards memory leaks. Your system just grows more memory over time. Does that answer your question? While you get that, I'll give you. We have other people, so the question is, right, the journey was kind of, we sped some things up, which caused us to go to the second cache, which ended up being slower, so then we deliberately slowed ourselves down and restricted ourselves in order to provide, you know, some wins there. And like, your cache was small. The answer is, the cache is too small, and there are other people pursuing that at the same time. But I didn't want to do cache size tuning, because that's not nearly as fun as lock-free programming. <laughs> Uh, did the person online answer with if that answered their question? I think that that person was satisfied. Great. Is that a hand? That's right. Look guilty. <laughs> yes. Um, so the question is, did I think about leaving a couple elements always in the queue so that so that, that element is always available? And the issue is, who's doing that? At some point, someone is going to come along and warn me that like they're going to take that element. I need to refill that element somehow. And I need a thread to do it, and I don't actually have a background thread. So I have to do it during something. And the question is, when? Right, but that's what I'll do. So the, the suggestion is I could just pull from the central queue to refill it back up to that minimum level. But essentially, this is what I'm doing where the minimum level is zero. And if I, I can't, since I don't have a background thread to do the balancing in the background, I have to do it on one of the workers, one of the people doing a push or a pop. And so I haven't actually optimized anything. I've just changed the point at which I go to the central free list, but I'm still going there with the same frequency. So the claim is I might reduce contention in this way because there'll be things. I, I think we're talking past each other slightly. And I want to get to the online audience. Do you mind if we like cover this together after? Uh, go ahead. OK, a few people are wondering whether this code is available online. Yes, this code is available online. And it is github.com slash probably Google slash TC Malik. But if you just search for Google TC Malik GitHub on your favorite search engine, <laughs> I'm sure that you will find the thing. Also, this presentation is available online. Let me try and get all the way back. I hope everyone's enjoying our trip down memory lane. That was a good joke. There's some clever observations here. Ah, ABA problems. They're the worst. All right. Well, now oh, now now we're at the like basics. How do things work? Nope, nope, we're almost there. 
now, now we're about to get to the like who inspired me, and here we are. So you can actually see this presentation yourself, and if you want to follow the notes for it, the speaker notes are pretty good, and you can look at the commit history to see how I make presentations. I warn you, it's a train wreck. <laughs> All right, thank you.